Okay, the power of story. I said that in my two Sundays in July, today and the 17th, we're going to be focused on Mary in approaching her feast day, her saint's day, which is July 22nd. And it's a topic of enormous passion for me. Um, it's this focus of my next book, which will probably not get written in this lifetime, but sooner or later, because it is mine to do. And it really began to fall together for me in powerful ways when I realized and thought about the power of story and the confusion that can happen when we mistake story for fact. When we believe there's only one story. And that was not the case in early uh, in the early years of the Christian era. There were many stories about who Jesus was, what had happened to him, what was the result of that. There were many throughout the Mediterranean basin, throughout the known world at the time, from Alexandria to, to um, France to Syria to Jerusalem, of course, and then Paul's work through what is now Turkey and Greece. And eventually, in the fourth century, so we're not talking about they hurried up and got it done overnight, but after you know 300 more, more years, uh, the Emperor Constantine, who had been converted because he won a battle under the side of the cross and thought that was a good sign, said, you guys have got to get your act together. You've got to decide what's so and what's not. You cannot have all this mishmash of different ideas and different teachings and different practices. Uh, everybody had been perfectly happy with different you know, with all of that mishmash for centuries, but he was the emperor. So they got together in Nicaea, and they, the council decided on the story, the acceptable story. And it is the story that we have known for 2,000 years. And there were each, many, many of these, this mishmash of ideas and Prince had written material to go with it, books and rituals and sit hymns and songs. And it was all destroyed if it didn't conform to what they agreed on as the story. It took a long time for that to begin to change. And in terms of Mary Magdalene, we have spent so much of this time trying to fit her into that story, assuming that story is the only story. It is the true story. It is the factual story. As we said earlier, stories don't have to have anything to do with facts. You know, Charles Hill got in trouble once for saying, if it could be definitively proved that Jesus had never lived, it would not affect the power of his teaching. You know, the teachings are true. Uh, the story of how we can receive those teachings is an important and powerful story, but it's a story. So I began to realize that it's not about working Mary Magdalene into that story. Was she a prostitute? Was she, you know, was she his wife? Did she have kids? What's the story? What's going on? Uh, was she the woman who was you know, healed of seven demons? But, but there were so many Marys in the Gospels in that version of the story that it's almost hard to keep track of them. And suddenly, not so long ago, I realized it's a different story. Tell Mary's story. Tell the story that she taught and that many, many other people heard and believed and shared and grew from and learned from and became more expressive of their own spiritual power because that was the essence of her message. So I want to tell you the story very quickly this morning. And then the next time we're here, we'll talk about what it means and, and what her teachings, how they, how they change our understanding of truth. 
Uh, some of this is totally mine. I made it up. Some of it comes from reading a number of different texts that have only recently become available. Uh, texts that are more considered Gnostic. Gene was Jesse, because yes, Mary was definitely a Gnostic. Gnosticism means that well, these principles are Gnostic. It means knowing. Gnosis is knowing. It means you don't learn and you don't receive. You know that, that it comes from the inside and works out. It comes from our thoughts into the world, not from the world into our thoughts. Mary was born and raised in the city of Magdala. I stopped briefly there when I was in Jerusalem, in, in Israel in February. There's nothing much to see now, although they have started a, a dig, so there may be more later before they come. But it was a, a significant city on the, the Sea of Galilee. Um, and it was a very cosmopolitan city. So, whereas the truth is, although it doesn't seem to be much part of the story sometimes, the truth is that Jesus was a Jew. It seems pretty clear that Mary Magdalene was not a Jew. She was a practitioner and, I believe, a priestess of the mystery religions. She had her own following. She had her own uh, awareness of truth. Um, and it was what we would consider the feminine aspect of the divine. But it was about love and healing and empowerment personal empowerment. She and Jesus came together, met each other. Um, one version that I've read, one story that I've read is that uh, her mother knew his mother, you know, one, one of those things, and the mother said, you ought to talk to my daughter, she's as almost as crazy as you are. Um, and so they got together after Jesus had been so long in the wilderness and after Mary had done so much work on her own spiritual path, and they discovered that they were speaking the same truth. And Jesus discovered that there was one disciple, Mary, who really got it, who really understood him. Somebody challenged me on this this week, and I said, I can't tell you how joyful it makes me to know that Jesus had someone who got him. You know, someone he didn't have to teach, someone he didn't have to make allowances for, like, okay, I'll say it again one more time, but please try to pay, pay attention. Uh, someone who really got it, that he could go to at night and talk about the overall truth, talk about what it all meant and where it was all going and what the implications of it would be. Um, were they married? Were they lovers? Did they have sex? It is an insult to Mary Magdalene to even ask the questions, isn't it? It's like the only possible role she could play would be in relationship to Jesus. Was she his wife? Was she his girlfriend? Was she his wife? She was Mary Magdalene. Mm -hmm. She was his equal. She was his support. She was, as was recognized widely and universally, really, even in the other story, she was the disciple closest to him. She was the disciple who, with whom he shared secrets, truths that he couldn't, that he knew. You know, the fishermen and the farmers were not ready to hear. She was the disciple who knew what he proposed to do during the last week of his earthly ministry. She knew that he wanted to demonstrate the truth, the truth of eternal life, the truth that death is an illusion, the truth that there's nothing to fear, so those choices being made out of fear don't have to be. You can choose out of love. You can choose out of knowing yourself as an eternal spiritual being because that's the truth. And from beginning to end, in all the Gospels, all the four Gospels that were included in the original story, Mary is there, standing, watching, 
holding Baha'i watch. That's the quote, that's the uh, prophet, Habakkuk quote to put it. Holding Baha'i watch, knowing the truth. Knowing the truth. So, this is where it gets interesting. And this is where the stories begin to split. Uh, in the Gospel of the Beloved Companion, which I had discussed here before, which is a second century document which has only recently been translated into English because it was held and treasured by the people of Languedoc, the area of France, southeastern, I'm very bad at directions, but I think southeastern France, closer to Italy. And where tradition says Mary went, lived, taught, healed, and died. And there is a, an abbey in Aesop and Bolas that tradition says was where she, uh, where she died, and it's in tomb somewhere. There, there's another, the Eastern Orthodox Church says that no, she went to Ephesus with Mary, the mother of Jesus, and lived there until she died. Well, I have seen that house. I have been in that house. It is about this, it is smaller than this stage. They could not have gotten along <laughs> that well in that little house. I don't believe it for a minute. Plus, Mary Magdalene was not about retreating from the world. She was about healing the world. She was about sharing the truth and awakening it in other people. So she couldn't have done that from that beautiful mountaintop outside Ephesus, where Mary the mother of Jesus lived after, after the events of his lifetime. Mary taught in the Gnostic tradition. And the Gospel of the Beloved Companion is one of the documents that was that they tried to destroy completely um, so that only one version of the story would remain. Um, there are others. The Gospel of Philip, another second century. Uh, and, and again, we didn't know there was a Gospel of Philip until the middle 20th century when we just, the discoveries of Mark Mahdi were, were made. The Gospel of Thomas. And Thomas and, and Mary were very close. And uh, his Gospel seems to be an attempt to kind of bridge the gap. Because there was a gap. Because According to the Gospel of the Beloved Companion, immediately in the aftermath of Jesus' demonstration of truth, of his resurrection, which is really kind of a misnomer because he didn't resurrect, he walked through the illusion and came up the other side, is what he did. And after that, he appeared to the disciples who were hiding in an upper room, and he said, carry the message from here. And he left. And Peter said, Mary, tell us what he told you. Because he was so much closer to you than us. And help us understand. And we're going to talk about that the next time I'm here. It's the vision of the great tree, and it's astonishing. It doesn't change Jesus' teachings at all, but it reframes them and refocuses them in a beautiful way. And when she was done sharing that vision, Peter said, that's crazy. You're, that's crazy talk. Yeah. And refused to hear her, refused to honor her, and many of the disciples agreed with him and followed him. Now, why is that? Well, the first obvious thing we're going to say is, well, she was a woman. And men did not take guidance from women at that time. They just didn't. So there was that. <laughs> There was also a degree you can read it in the gospel. This was great jealousy. You know, Jesus always liked you best. Kind of thing. Okay, why were you so close to him and I wasn't? Why would he tell you things he wouldn't tell me? And the other thing is fear. Jesus said, Go out and spread the word. And they were huddled in a corner because they were afraid. They, they, if, they, if, he was, if, they, if they would do that to Jesus, what would they do to us? And certainly, if they went out with the wild, new spiritual perspective that Mary was sharing, it would be crazy. They would be, they, they would be lost. They, you know, they were afraid to do that. What they did do was try to 
made Jesus a Jewish prophet, try to compromise with the, the temples so that um, they, would, they wouldn't be discriminated against, they would be Jewish. And that, of course, led to more conflict in that story when, when Paul started converting so many people who were not Jewish. Mary and Thomas left. There's no indication that she fought or tried to persuade them or tried to take over. She wasn't interested in a structure. Peter and his friends went off and built a church with rules and regs and, you know, vestments and cathedrals eventually, and tried to tell people at large what Jesus meant and what the implications were for them. There's no question that that story has been powerful in many wonderful, wonderful ways through the years. Music alone. Um, where would we be without, artistically in any way, where would we be without those stories we love and grow up with and cherish and the images they hold and represent? But it, it, it takes nothing away from that story to know that there's another story. There's another way of seeing it. In addition to the Gospels, Philip and Thomas and Mary Magdalene, I have recently been discovered, stumbled onto um, what is called the Pistis Sophia. Uh, Sophia is the goddess of wisdom. And it is a document, a Gnostic document from about the second century. And it tell, in it, Jesus stays with his disciples for 14 days, and he teaches them a day at a time. And it, most of it is Q&A. You know, they ask him the questions, he answers. 23 of the questions come from Mary Magdalene mm. to clarify points that he's making. Uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's an astonishing thing. It's just an astonishing affirmation of her awareness at one point in the uh, Mr. Sophia, he says to her, Mary, thou blessed one, whom I perfect in all mysteries of the high, speak out openly, thou whose heart is raised to the kingdom of heaven more than all thy brethren. So he is saying to her, you get it. Do speak it. Speak the truth. Draw the truth. And so she never, she was never about forming a church or getting a large, you know, following or having a board of directors or putting out a newsletter or, you know, getting a website set up or anything like that. She was interested in meeting people one on one and in telling them the story and telling them the truth. And as I said, it, it, for me, it just expands the wonder and the mystery of Jesus and of these teachings in wonderful ways. It takes nothing away from them. Do you see that? Yes. It takes nothing away from Jesus to say he wasn't alone. He wasn't the only. He wasn't trying to be the only. He was trying to awaken the same thing in all of us. And it's just wonderful to know that at least, at least he found it in their Magdalene. And she was able to support him and work with him and walk with him and understand and discuss things. And he was able to process the events of the day with her as they went along. And she was able to understand his message in a way that does not conflict with what the church says his message was, but makes it personal. So it's not about forming churches and a, a top-down hierarchy where, where only the top communicates with God and will tell the rest of you what God said as we go along. It was a one-on-one. -on -one. The Gospel of Thomas, which some of you I know have read or have referenced to, a um, collection of uh, 141 sayings of Jesus, does not try to correct any of the events of his life, doesn't care. That's the other thing about the Gnostic writings, all of them. They don't care. You know, was he born in Nazareth, or was he born in Bethlehem, or did they live in Nazareth and move to Bethlehem? Who cares? 
Whichever story you like, go with it. Here's what's important. Here's the truth. Here's what he knew and demonstrated. Here's how he healed. Here's what he left with us. So the Gnostic writings are about the teachings. They are about a sense of personal awareness. They become another story. And the story has never gone away. It has always been there. It is the mystical. It is the story of Jesus the mystic. Jesus the spiritual truth. And it has appeared through certain writers, certain saints now, um, in the other story, as the other story evolved. Occasionally, a mystic would appear and very often would get burned at the stake for their trouble, but, um, but would share this passionate, personal experience of Jesus, Teresa of Adel, John of the Cross. Um, I could go on and on. That's a whole other topic. But it didn't matter. It didn't matter whether the, the established church, whether this story will believe had room for this story or not. Uh, what mattered was that this story stayed alive, and it did. And I believe passionately that it found its ultimate expression here on this continent with this nation. We're still in the process, of course. Um, not always doing very well at it, but we will, we will succeed. We will try it. Ralph Waldo Emerson, Thoreau, um, the, the whole transcendental movement which led to Christian science, which led to unity, which led to new thought, which led to the, what was then the new thought, the radical idea that Jesus was not about a church. Jesus was about you. Jesus was about knowing your power, not bowing down to his. That's the story that Mary Magdalene was told to share. It's the story she did share through her life, through her work. It's the story I feel from her now. Uh, I think it may be time for it may be time for Mary, do you think? Maybe it's time for us to say it doesn't have to be this paternalistic, hierarchical, top-down story. There is another way of seeing it. There is another story that was equally valid, that is equally rooted in, in the same lifetime, that grows out of the same teachings, and it sees it completely differently. So we don't have to try and work with the hierarchical story. We can bless it, appreciate it, use it, and know that this story is where we belong. This story is about me. It's about my Christ self. It is not about recognizing Jesus as the only begotten Christ. It is recognizing that what he said that he meant. What I have done, you will do in great things on these. Don't get excited. No, I'm just showing you a bit of what you could do. He never claimed it for himself. That story claimed it for him. This story is not. And in two weeks, we will look at the vision of the great tree. And uh, I think you'll be delighted by the understanding it represents. But until then, let's just, let's just know that this month is Mary, Mary Magdalene's month. It is an opportunity, and all oh, people, if there were ever uh, a world in which we needed this, an opportunity to be the love, an opportunity to embrace the feminine of spiritual truth. The energy of, not just of love, but of creation, of giving birth. All of that. It's time for that now. Uh, I think we're, what we're seeing in a lot of places is a really strong resistance to the fact that things are changing. The fact that this, the old story isn't holding. People aren't living in its shadow, afraid to challenge it anymore. There's a lot of fear involved. The brighter the light, the darker the shadows. We're seeing 
darkness and dark shadows right now. That simply means we are becoming a brighter and brighter light. So this holiday weekend, make it yours. Make it your affirmation of freedom, of independence, of knowing and being who you truly are. Don't hide it. Speak out openly, Jesus says. Speak out openly. Be who you are. Know the truth. And then bless us. I'll see you in two weeks.